excited to talk with you, Ed, because boy, oh boy, do you have an interesting story, my friend. You have this memoir on the road less traveled that we're going to get into, but could you talk a little bit about what inspired you to write this in general? You know, what happened basically is when I was 18 years old, I was very ashamed of being in an orphanage. So I decided I went to college, you know, and I, I talked to kids about this. You have a choice. When you go to college, you cross that bridge mm -hmm. and you can become a different person. So I became a different person. I did not discuss my, I buried my past life. Someone said a little bit of denial doesn't hurt. I didn't have to explain to people. My, my father was a radio operator. He was at sea. My mother died when I was three. That rhymes. And so I let it at that. And people ask any more than that. I basically didn't didn't pass it on. Sixty five years later, my wife, my three children and the University of Rochester, when I became the chairman of the board, said they wanted to know more. My especially my wife and kids, they said, you know, you should write this down. They didn't know, know the whole story because I just I was ashamed. I didn't want any special privileges for being in an orphanage and so on. But then I started to write, and it really became enlightening to me. When I finished the first galley, I sent it out to 15 or 20 of my friends. They said, you can't just write this for your family. You've got to take it public. Because everyone, as the, the ex-secretary of, 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 of commerce said, Barbara Franklin, every freshman in, in the United States ought to read this. So that's a small goal that we have. But yes. it, it, is, it, it basically sends a message that anything, Haley, anything is possible. You know that. I mean, yeah. you really you put your mind to it. You're only limited by your imagination and how hard you want to work in America. And so I, I want to take that story out. I'm finding it's very, it resonates very much with first gens, you know, spending a lot of time with first gen students. That's why I decided to write it. But, but then as I write it, it became, you know, it sort of captured its own world and sort of came its own life. People kept saying, Ed, this is really good. You got to, so I, I, now, now I'm not afraid. We've sold 15,000 copies. Mm -hmm. And we have uh, about 200, over 200 five-star ratings. So, you know, it's not embarrassing. And when I got the second book. Yeah, you do, Ed. Just signed a contract for that. I That's love the galley. That's yeah. the galley. Being printed now. It'll be out, uh, be out next April. Uh, so I'm, it's, it's been fun. And a guy my age, I don't know what else you do. I, I still do. I still work a little bit. And I have a, I've worked for a company and plays a little golf and, you know, I, I have a bunch of stuff that I do still, but this has been a whole new world for me because one reason I kept it silent is I've always lived as a private person. Mm -hmm. And now I have to talk to the Haley's of the world and they're taking me out in the public. And yes. my, my daughter says, that's dangerous. I said, I know, I know Corey, she works for Ted talks. So wow. she handles the real public arena. Yes. And I've always kept, you know, to live happy is to live hidden. You know, I was the CEO of an investment bank, but they would call me, you want to be on television? No, you want to be in the newspaper? No. I want to do my job and because being a public person as I am now is a it's a full time job. You have to be, you know, sensible. You gotta answer questions which are not answerable, you know. <laughs> yes, totally. I think that's so special, Ed, that you waited so long to write this too. You know, it wasn't just like, I have a story, I'm gonna make a cash grab as soon as I can. Like you really lived your life, made yourself a career and did all these things and then we're like, I get it's time. It's time to share this. And it's interesting as this writer, I realized the message I have is I have really in um, I've lived long enough to do almost everything. I mean, I, I I failed very early as a young man. I always say that early failure is a gift because you learn an awful lot. I mean, I put there's a lot of failure in there. I've been married for 57 years, which is a little bit unique these days. Yes. <laughs> I have three children and eight grandchildren, seven grandsons. So I have all the, all the successes and problems you could have. Yeah. And I've been I've had jobs that you know range all over the place i was a naval officer i was an engineer i worked at all the jobs on wall street and i became a manager eventually and so there was a it was it, i've covered a lot of things i you know i've changed jobs i've i've done really badly and got you know sort of fired and then i've done really well and got fired so i know I, no matter what you do you and I, I have a message now one of my new messages in the last six months has been never be a victim yes. if you read my book you'll find out that's one of my successes I always use the energy of, of victimization to drive myself forward to say, what's next? Because using being a victim, you can use energy. You know, you, you don't like somebody or you don't like some organization. It takes energy. Instead of using the energy in that direction, use it in the other direction to sort of find out what's next. I mean, I got rejected by all the golf course, all the clubs in Nantucket, even though I was a fairly successful 60-year-old you know, person. I decided to build my own golf course, and it turned out to be one of the great experiences of all times. I mean, I kid about this, but 
You walk up to the to the you know the snack bar at the end of nine holes, and you say to the little girl, "I'd like to have a you know a iced tea." She says, "What's your number?" You say number one. <laughs> <laughs> That's my new life motto, and I love that. <laughs> It's only one number one, you know. That's that's it. So that's the, I was the first member of the club, so no. But the club has become a an institution on the island with the largest charity now. We send uh, you know two kids to college, and now he's last year we sent ten kids to vocational school. Wow. And chefs and nurses, isn't that interesting? Because I believe one of my many crusades is that I think that kids ought to have a choice to go to vocational colleges. Oh, you want to be a chef? You want to be a teacher? I mean, uh, you want to be a nurse? You want to be a marine engineer? You should be able to do that. You have to go to college and necessarily do that. So we're doing that up in Nantucket. And we're the largest charity on the island now. So we, we supply 50 different charities with, with, with compensation every year. So That's incredible. I well, you know, but that's never predictive. They, they, they'll just go on. To find out what's next. You know, get, go after it. Love him. So my copy is in the mail. They're sending me one, and they're sending oh. us a few extras to give away as well. So very Good. excited Thank to do that. Thank you. And you teased it a little bit, and obviously we're going to read the book to learn more, but can you talk a little bit about your childhood more? Well, what happened basically is my father, you know, came over on, you know, came over as an immigrant in 1900 as, a, as an infant. And there was a story about where he was born. But anyway, and then for the next 28, nine years, he became fascinated as a teenager. He was actually in the First World War. He became fascinated as a teenager with, with the technology of the day, which was radio. He went to work for RCA, and if you look back, RCA did extremely well in the 20s. And everybody was, you know, borrowing money nine to one. Right. You, you took a dollar and you bought $10 worth of stock. Mm -hmm. And he became quite wealthy. He had pictures of him with airplanes. He owned buildings. You know, he never got married. He was 29 years old. And come 29, he lost it all. In 1933, as he said it, Eli and his mother died also. She was a, a matriarch in the community. And community was in really dire state. So she, and she was, he was very close to his mother. And 33, he decided that he was either going to commit suicide or drive to California where the streets were paved with gold. Yep. Uh, he, good for him, he decided to drive to California or else I wouldn't be here today. Exactly. So then the way he stopped and met, a, 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 was unwelcomed at a distant cousin's home who had six kids. And he surprisingly at his age, 33 years old, fell in love with the fifth of six children. She was only 18. He was 15 years older than she was. They went on to California. The streets weren't paved with gold. He had trouble getting a job. He was he was cut out of the you know the the Middle Eastern mentality as far as men are concerned for women. They shouldn't work. They should be in the home. And here he wasn't earning a living. In fact, in my birth certificate, it says born to an unemployed father and a homemaker mother. And uh, she put up with it for a while. He also had very strict, strong eating habits, and he was a very tough guy. And if you've read Leon Uris, he he basically was kind of like Ibrahim. He ruled the roost and didn't make a living to do it. And so in 1939, at age 24, it's very surprising, very strong woman decided to get divorced. And she got divorced and got complete custody of me. He got $5 a week of alimony and child support and visiting rights only on Sunday. She took me from Los Angeles to St. Louis. And she was not terribly welcomed at her house because they didn't believe in divorce. They also didn't need another two mouths to feed. So when dad arrived a couple of weeks later for his Sunday visit, he decided instead of leaving me there, he would essentially kidnap me and take me back to Los Angeles. Oh, okay. So I was three years old. And he told me that my, he told my mother not to look for us. And she felt that maybe she was wrong, that maybe I'd be better off with him. She was thinking and not feeling. And he was feeling and not thinking, not knowing what he's going to do with a three-year-old. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so I spent the next two years with either a neighbor lady, because he was going to sea as a marine, merchant marine. Mm -hmm. I would either spend time with neighbor ladies or in hotels. Then when the war started, he was drafted or volunteered to become an officer in the merchant marines. And so he had to do something with me. He put me into the Catholic welfare, uh, welfare system, and I ended up going living in five different foster homes. In those days, they weren't the most pleasant places. The first one was, you know, cold and uncaring and somewhat uh, abusive. Uh, the last one was warm and caring. It was unfortunately short, short duration. After the war was over, my father decided to, you know, reunite. So we, I flew from Los Angeles to uh, uh, New York. Uh, in Ten it was twenty hours, wow. and uh, he and I spent the, the summer in the Sloan House on Thirty Fourth Street in New York City. 
mm-hmm. together. Then since I had to go to school, we, we got an, he got an apartment, a hotel room in Coney Island and looked for land-based work. And he couldn't find it. And in fact, the summer of 47, he went away on a ship and unfortunately he couldn't find any of me. I spent better than a month by myself, 11 years old, in a hotel room. Oh my gosh. Ed. Anyway, the person he was supposed to leave me with didn't want to take me. So he called from the, the uh, sea and got me into an orphanage. And I, I uh, spent three and a half years in the first orphanage. And then he disappeared completely. And, and, and I, when I was 15 years old, I became a ward of the state. And luckily, some wonderful social worker, instead of putting me, you know, could, a kid could have been put any place in those days, reform school or, you know, not, not a great place. I got put in a fairly good, good orphanage in... Uh, I it is called the line, okay. Uh, I, I put an orphanage in, in Yonkers, which was uh, two and a half blocks or three blocks from a good high school. Oh. And then I found my, I, I decided what my ticket out of this whole situation was, was get good grades and go to a private college. Most of the kids in the orphanage either didn't go to college or they went to a public, public institution. So I thought I was going to go to a private college, and that was my ticket out. In a t- private college, I was, first year was terrible. I mean, I got rejected by all the fraternities. I was wearing a black leather jacket, I had long hair. You know, it didn't didn't it used to have hair, but <laughs> but but you know, it just I didn't work. I didn't talk right. I, mean, I also didn't feel right. But by my sophomore year, I blended in, and, and I really had a fabulous uh, a college career. I had to work most of the time, but I still had to grow. So that was, that was that's the early life. But all those disadvantages, you see, looking back, a lot of them became advantages. Think of yourself living, learning to live in 15 or 20 different places before you're 18. Mm-hmm. You get very adaptable. Yeah. I always tell them, when you go from one schoolyard to the next, learn how to get, get on there and then go to the next one, you really have learned something. So you got very adaptable. You also get very resilient mm-hmm. being one place to the other and so forth. Resilience is like a muscle. You use it, get stronger. You, get, you learn preservation, perseverance. You also get a certain amount of self-confidence mm-hmm. you know, through the whole period. So... What I'm telling these first-gen kids is many of them are more prepared for the difficult things in life than other kids who don't have that, that have it too good in early life. So, so I, I, and then the, I, I did get a lot of anger, and luckily, I, instead of using this anger externally, be mad at Haley and be mad at somebody else, I took that anger and I focused it on doing better. It was energy that I used in the right direction. So I tell also people, you're going to be angry because as a young person, you look around, you say, why me? Why haven't I ever got, you know, you arrive at campus, you're carrying your suitcase and everybody's being unloaded by their parents and so forth and so on. And you don't have it. Or on a holiday, you go away with your roommate, you see this wonderful home and you say, what about me? So you get a little angry. But if you can direct that energy, that anger away from other people and other things toward doing better, you get actually gives you strength. So those disadvantages become advantages if you're careful with them. I love your attitude, Ed, 100 percent. And through that story obviously you rose like the phoenix what steps would you say you took to do that obviously you were in the orphanages how did you even get to the point of going to college well you know i i put my head down when i was a sophomore and i said i'm going to get good grades and i was good but i did have some genes i i was good math and science and i was an athlete i I was a varsity basketball and baseball player even i wasn't very big so i had those two things but scholarships in those days were not not very plentiful. In fact, the one I thought I might get, which was the New York State scholarship, I didn't get. But I applied for the Naval ROTC scholarship. They only give 1,200 of them in the entire country. Wow. And I got one of them. So that was a big, big breakthrough. Because you, you, you had to spend three years in the Navy once you graduated college. You had to wear a uniform once a week and you know, a bunch of other stuff. I wanted to go to Cornell. I couldn't go to Cornell because with a Naval scholarship would take five years and I didn't have the money for the fifth year. So I, I didn't know anything about the University of Rochester, mm-hmm. but they said, we'll get you through in four years. What I didn't realize was that meant an eight o'clock class, five, six days a week <laughs> and a laboratory every afternoon and one laboratory too. But I got out in four years, yeah. which was what I have wanted to do. But that's that was my secret. And that's why my other message is Anything is possible, but education is the solution to everything. Not, I don't have to say what kind of education. Education, learn. It's, it's a lifelong process. Yes. It's really a lifelong process. I graduated, you know, from engineering school with losing slide rule. Three years later, after I got out of the Navy, my first job in the chemical industry, we had computers, beginning of computers. So I had to learn that all over again. If I didn't learn computers, I'd be, I, couldn't, I couldn't do my work. Yeah. 
and graduated the business school. Didn't anything go called internet. You had to relearn the internet. So, so it's those are the things that you know it sort of drove me forward. I but I had a picture, and the picture I got really were well from the nuns in the Catholic school. Mm-hmm. Made it very clear that if you did the right things, you ended up the right place. If you did the wrong things, you ended up the wrong place. You know, so that was easy to decide. But also the movies in those days, there were really a lot of good guys that really you know they. You know, Jimmy Stewart and, and John Wayne and even Batman and Superman in the shadow. They always did good stuff, you know, mm-hmm. and th- they were sort of role models and there was never anything wrong with any of them. Uh, I always say right now, don't don't try to have heroes because you take traits from heroes. Like right. one of my heroes is Winston Churchill. You yeah. really want his perseverance. You don't want his drinking habits, right? Right, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> yeah, or it's awesome. like Steve Jobs. I would love to be as creative as Steve Jobs. You don't want his personality, a terrible personality. <laughs> so I don't hero worship. But in those days, you kind of did. You went, these people, you know, John Wayne, he was perfect almost. And so you sort of had that role model and you say, can I be like that? And so, you know, that's what, that's what, so those are, and my father was supportive. He abandoned me three complete times. He left me alone three times. But when his letters and his conversation it was unconditional love, he really, Felt, he kept saying, you're the best, you know, you're the greatest. In fact, I have a letter in my book. It says that I'm not always a good boy because you know? <laughs> there was no I could never do anything wrong. And he sent me messages, you know, like always dress well, and always work hard. Yeah. Well, cleanliness is next to godliness. He said those messages. So that's why I believe in some of the organizations I'm involved with now, because I, kids need counseling. They need somebody to talk to. That's what parents were about in the old days. Parents that they, you know. Most of these kids only, either don't have parents that I'm dealing with or have one parent that is not capable. So you need, you need mentoring. Absolutely. And I love what you just said about your dad, too, because, you know, of course, just looking at it black and white, him abandoning you, that's not a great look. But I like that you open it up. Like, he wasn't a bad person. He <laughs> did these and he really loved me. nice He loved I mean, you. He, have, and... he, he must have loved me. He loved me more than anything else in the world. And what I've learned as being a businessman, when you lose everything, you get demons. Yeah. You know, you know, you know, if you get way up there, you know, an airplane and limousines and, and you know, and buildings and you know, your, your your shirts are all you know beautiful from great places and so forth, and all of a sudden you lose everything, you know, you, you get demons that are very hard to get rid of. You know, and so he had those demons all his life. Because when he when he went, you know, then when you lose everything, you have to take a lower station in life. And when you do that, you, you 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 associate with people that are different than you are, and they people those people recognize they don't accept you. Yep. You know, as if you you know if if you if you're the guy who was eating the fancy restaurant, that's fine. But the next morning, if you're the waiter, the other waiters don't associate with you so well. So he had trouble integrating after he lost everything, and then he of course lost me as well. Because and we were very close, you know, he was my father, I loved him and so forth and so on. But as I got older, when I left the Navy, he was very upset. And we had a, we had, we had a terrible time because he should have stayed in the Navy because that was the best thing, best part of his life. Right. Then, of course, when I left engineering to go to business school, he was, oh, my God, what are you doing? It took all this money you saved and, you know, bet it on some school. And the worst of all, he didn't really accept my wife, Barbara, because she looked like my mother. Now, I didn't know that. I didn't know that because I never saw a picture of my mother. So, but obviously, you know, and she also came from the same part of the world. Her, her parents came from the, from Eastern, Eastern Europe and he didn't think that was such a good idea. So, so we, 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 you know, toward the end of life, we were, we were peaceable coexistence. It wasn't the same kind of relationship because I had to live my life. And that's another thing I, I tell people, you know, your parents are wonderful and there's a part of your life where you're really dependent on them. But at some point in time, you must live your own life. Yeah. And that, you know, Grandpa maybe just you know has his own way of thinking. By the way, I also believe we all grow up in a particular context. I can't advise people. I grew up in the Depression, the war, the seventies. These kids for the last forty years have had a really besides nine eleven, and it wouldn't affect all everybody. Have a different background, so it's a, you can't you can't really say this is how it's done. I mean, it's not, if you're these kids want long hair, God bless them. <laughs> Absolutely, Ed. I love that. Well, flash forward to today. You have so many accomplishments under your belt. In addition to the book, what would you say you are most proudest of? Oh, but the family is the most, most, by, by, by far, 
the most of the family. Having having a wife, you know, Barbara. Not Barbara's. I wouldn't be here without Barbara. She, yes. you know, she's there to make when the turns in the road come. You know, she helps me make the turn. And and so the and I'm proud of having three children, all of which have master's degrees, all of which are self-employed. They're not. They're not. You know, they're not changing the world. Terrific. My daughter is a TED Talk. She is changing the world. My son's an architect. My oldest son's a movie maker. They're all gamefully employed. So that's that's now I have nine grandchildren, eight grandchildren, all of which are exciting and so forth. As far as accomplishments concerned, it's fascinating to me. I spent 50 years on Wall Street. I've gotten more satisfaction out of being the chairman of the board of trustees at the University of Rochester than anything else. That's awesome. That that if, if it was an accomplishment, that was my biggest accomplishment. I had thirty thousand people, you know, you know ten thousand students and and we really, the, the president and I, I mean, he did most of the work, but we really changed the university. We raised over a billion dollars for the first time in the firm in history. We, we added almost $900 million worth of new, new, new buildings, more professorships and scholarships than any time in the past. And I've maintained them. And they, they named the school after me, which is very important because, you know, it's very hard to pronounce my name. And, and now these kids who go to the school have to learn how to pronounce my name. So that's it. <laughs> Hajim sounds much better, but it's not correct. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And, and it must feel extra special, too, with that being your alma mater to go back. My alma mater, and, you know, it's nice. And I, I'll tell you a secret if you'll not tell anybody else. There's a statue of me on the campus. <gasps> and I'm the first one in my neighborhood to have a statue. <laughs> and that's freaking awesome. How accurate would you say it is to how you look? No, it's just, pardon? Good. <laughs> it's crazy, but they, they wanted to do it. They, they named the engineering quadrangle after, and they put a statue up there. So I'm standing like this. Kids <laughs> haven't done too much damage to it yet, but it's it's uh, you know. So it, it that, that's great satisfaction, and I'm not I'm not embarrassed about that because if you work hard enough, you know, get lucky enough, you find some place where they can be nice to you if you're nice to them. Then mm -hmm. you know, I I, uh, I I've spent a lot of time up there. I mean, during my eight years as the chairman, I made seventy trips to Rochester. And I went to about 65 or 70 different graduations. So, you know, we, I put the time. Well, you have to do it. I actually closed my hedge fund when I took the job because I said, you know, I believe that there's four parts of life and it's, you know, self, family, work and, and giving back or community. And if you're going to do something in an area, either it's work or community, you got to concentrate on it. You have to focus on it. And you can't be, you know, doing half buttons part time. So, so I, I quit my quit my basic my business for all intents and purposes and really focused on the on the university but it was, it was fun and i get a, i do get a kick out of it i said to the kids now lifelong you're gonna have to pronounce my name correctly which i struggle with oh you know i don't get you may have gotten it right but very few of them get it right it's hey jim is that right it's, yeah it's, it was it, it was invented by the by the customs my daughter has done a worldwide study she found some guy in a prison in morocco with the same name but the five letters that the there's no such five letters anyplace, just my family. So it was made up by the customs and, you know, we, my father anglicized it, then lived happily ever after. Yep. Wow. That's crazy. I have a new life goal now and not to have a statue of me someday, Ed. <laughs> that is so cool. Obviously, you've taken the positive road after everything you kind of went through. So what advice would you give to someone who maybe is feeling discouraged because they also had a tougher background and they don't know how to rise from that? Well, I, you know, I, I try to I, I use what I call my four P's. Mm -hmm. Find your passions, find your principles, find your partners and then find your plans. And the last one is most important to these people. They've got to sit down and write down where they want to go and how they think they might get there. And what are the obstacles, obstacles of getting there? When you start writing it down, you find out the obstacles are not that great. You can get there. But when you start writing, it's very important. But the, the initial thing is finding your passion. Find what really excites you. Because if, you, if you're doing something that excites you and interests you, then you really won more than half the battle. Even if it doesn't pay well. I mean, I, I, use, I use all kinds of examples of, of, of people who, who live happily ever after doing what they really want to do. And I was very lucky to find what I wanted to do was something that people would pay for. Mm -hmm. But you don't have to do it that way. So, but find, you know, I, I, I'll give you a quick one on, on me. When I was in high school, when I was in high school, it was, it was math and science, baseball, and basketball, and girls. Mm -hmm. When I got to college, you know, the, 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 the baseball and basketball, I mean, the, 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 the uh, math and science merged, morphed into engineering and chemical engineering. 
But the baseball and basketball, after my freshman year, I played freshman basketball, freshman baseball. It merged, it morphed into extracurricular activities. And I became very involved. I was the an editor of the yearbook. I was the business manager of the Dramatic Society. I was the chairman of the Engineering Council. I was actually the chairman of the, the Finance Board, which gave out all the money and, uh, to all the other activities. I was on the student government. I was social chairman of my fraternity, the hardest job I ever had. Wow. But the thing that changed my life was my junior year, I decided I'd form a, a humor magazine from scratch, put 30 people together. Principal, the president was against it. The provost was against it. The head of the librarian was against it. Most of the deans were against it, but I was going to do it. And when I proved to myself what I really do, what my real passion was, was to put people together to create a product, solve a problem, develop a program. And in doing that, what I really got a kick out of was helping people do better than they thought they could. Think about that. If you surround yourself with people who believe that you want them to do well, Mm -hmm. you're really home free. I didn't realize that until almost mid-career, when I was in my early 40s, I realized, I said, what, what's your, somebody asked me, like you did, like Haley said, Ed, what's your secret? And I started to think about it. What is my secret? Why am I successful as a businessman? Mm-hmm. And it's well, because people who come to work with me feel that I want them to do better. Yeah. And, and then I found another secret when I was working that way, once I realized that, is you could do almost anything if you don't care who gets the credit. Yeah, oh, I love that, Ed. And Haley, I'll give you an even bigger secret. Okay. Start to deflect credit. When someone says, Haley, you've done a great job, you know what you do? Think of somebody who helped you do that job and say, it wasn't really me, it was Mary. Three things happen. First of all, the person that asks you really is impressed. Second of all, you feel pretty good. And third of all, Mary finds out she feels pretty good. So you get a triple trifecta, as I call it. But it's also something that I really believe in because very rarely do you do anything that somebody else doesn't really help you. Like what someone will say to me, God, that was a great interview. I said, no, no. Haley asked the right questions. She reacted the way she should have reacted. She was smiling. She had a good time. You know, you know, you get a bad interview or you have a bad interview. There's no choice about it. I had very early, my early stages. I had one friend of mine, terrific guy, and he was just so dull. And, and he, 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 he asked a question. It was so open-ended. You couldn't, I mean, that's, you know, so, and there was no reaction. He, and he's a good friend, but it didn't happen. So always try to give somebody else the credit. And, and I think that you're going to you find your life is a, it becomes much more pleasant. But anyway, though, that was my passion. And, and I really love that. Now what I'm finding is I'm, I'm having somewhat of a passion for this book because it's getting people to do things that, you know, they, they, this woman wrote me a letter, said her, her daughter was confused, didn't know what she was going to do, read my book, and now she's going to college. Love it. Yes. You know, that's a biggie. That's a biggie. Yeah. That's a heart pounder, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, so it's, but your passion, you keep moving that passion, it's going to change over time, you know, especially, you know, people get married, have children, you know, you know, there's, but in life today is so long enough that you can have a number of passions and you have to seek them out. You can't, you know, sometimes you're in a place where they aren't available, you have to go to some other place. Right. And my daughter, my daughter was in the, she was in the financial business, she was a writer for Fortune, then she became in the financial business, she loved that. But just wasn't satisfying. So she took a career counseling program for a year while she was working and found what she really wanted was to communicate with bright people. So she got this job at TED Talks. And all she does now is talk to really bright people, helping them to do speeches. And she just loves it. Now she's traveling all over the world with these conferences. So, you know, well, you know, you love your job, I can tell. Yes, don't you? I yeah. do, Ed. That is your passion. What it, you're it, doing right now is your passion. Yeah, right? I'm pretty happy. <laughs> That's exactly no right. And if you weren't, you would you. I think your personality, you'd find something else to do. Thanks, Ed. <laughs> You're right. You're totally right. It's all about passion. I wouldn't want to be stuck here for eight hours doing something I didn't want to do. It does make it feel like it's not work. That's right. For sure. And is this what the next book is about? That's what the book is about. Yeah, well, this is what the new book is about about the four P's. But the, the book is about my life and. You have to sort of drag out some of the things that I did. And, you know, you'll, you'll get the lessons by the things that I did, the mistakes that I made, and, yeah. and the you know, pluses and minuses. And it's a, it's, it's a book that flows pretty well. It took me seven years <laughs> and four ghostwriters. Oh, God, I love you. Well, you know, the, the, I had a wonderful writer, a woman, that, that she basically threw the first book away and said, we're going to do a book. And, and she wanted much more drama. She wanted me to hate my father, yeah. and she'd have my voice, but she wrote well. 
So I took the book to the next lady. That lady, we worked for seven or eight months, and she had got depressed, and she she couldn't. She didn't do the book. Her for her mother died, and her father mm-hmm. had some problems. And so I then this guy who had been following me around for five years said, Glenn said, I'll write that book for you. And then COVID came, and we got it done in three or four months. But he had a big manuscript. So okay. it was all right. It was easy. But it, it took, so I think it reads pretty easily. You know, you, you'll get into it. And you'll, you'll get it. And some people like the first part because it's about my childhood. Other people like the business part. And I'm, I could write a book now on people who've emailed me who read the book. And they always talk about what, how their life was like mine. And that was really wonderful. I'm That's thinking about really doing it. I've kept a bunch of these. And, and, you know, and everybody's got a story. And I have a story. So I, I wrote my story. I love it. Not easy to write, though. Trust me. Yeah. I can Oof, imagine. I it's hard. It's hard because you have a thought, you put it down on paper, and you may not, it doesn't seem to convey. Then when you try to give it to the, the person to read it, does, is he getting what you're trying to say? It's right. really hard. Yeah. But, you know, you, you get people do write. And there are too many books being printed. There are four million books printed a year. So someone reads my book, I thank them. Oh, <laughs> absolutely. When can we look forward to the next one about the peas? Yeah. Yeah, April, April, May April. next year. It's being printed now, but it's printed in China, and they're backlogged about six months. So, but I've got a contract signed, and and I got the first galley, so I'm I'm pretty good shape. My my publicist, publisher doesn't do anything for you. My you, publicist is gonna is starting to promote it already. So yeah. we'll see. And you don't make any money, trust me. I lose money on every book that I that I sell. <clears throat> now I got a got a big upfront payment of a thousand dollars, and he takes ninety percent of the revenue. But he printed it, so, you know, God bless him. God love him. And you know what? It's making a difference, Ed, and that's what counts. You know, people are emailing you and telling them your story. Obviously, you've touched a lot of people with it. Yeah, I, I hope so, because that's the goal. For sure. Well, 2023 is right around the corner. We have the new book to look forward to, but what else are you looking forward to in the next year, Ed? Well, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to continuing <clears throat> to understand what I call the four parts, the, four, the the eight words which I'm using with people. And as I continue to talk to you and other people, I'm learning more and more about myself and about the, my, my eight words are self, family, work, and community, which is giving back. Those are the four parts of life. Yeah. And to be successful, you really have to participate in all of them. Yeah. Self comes early. One has to learn what self is. And as I'm learning, it's, it's a combination of genes and your experience. And the experience is based on, if you were an only child, it's one thing. And if you were number six out of 10, it's another thing. If you grew up in, you know, in a, in a, in a slum, it's one thing. If you grew up in Greenwich, Connecticut, like my kids did, it's a totally different. So that's become self. And, you know, family is something that's, that's very important. And it's what's left over after everything is said and done. Work is where we spend most of our time. And then community, if you don't give back, you don't have to give back early. You give back, give back sometime in your life. You're not going to get real satisfaction. So I'm learning about that. Then I'm also these four P's. I'm going to spend more time trying to understand what true passion is. And by the way, even uh, people I talk to, sometimes you got to delay your passion, as I did. I had to. I, went, I really wanted to go to business school, but I figured I'd spent four years as an engineer, so I went to work for an engineering company. And I, I was studying plastics before Dustin Hoffman. So what am I looking forward to? I'm also looking forward to. I'm. I, I think that the the stock market is some place where I've spent most of my life and it's kind of an intellectual video game. Yeah. And I'm kind of interesting how this particular period plays out. This is probably as complicated a period as we've ever had in my uh, 80 years of, of operations. It's really very complicated. You know, the change in interest rates, it was the first time in 40 years that interest rates have started going back up. That's changing a lot of things. It's the first time in my lifetime where America truly wasn't the only leader in the world. Mm-hmm. We're starting to have to share with other people. And these other people are not not as nice as we are. So that's a, a whole different change. America's changing. You know, America isn't a, no longer, you know, a, a white Protestant America. It's a, it's a mixed, really a mixed community. So these changes, these things fascinate me, mm-hmm. you know. And, uh, and I've got a third book too. So, you know, I've, I've got, I'm looking forward to next year. We, we are so privileged, my wife and I. We travel back and forth between this wonderful place in Florida and Nantucket, which is, you know, Nantucket is very special because it's real. Yeah. You know, it was there in 1850. Yeah. So it's a real, real community. And my golf club is a, is, a, is a ball. It's really fun. I've got 300 members. They're all kind of 
interesting people. So there's plenty of time to play golf and talk and so forth. So I'm just very lucky. I mean, I, I can look forward to almost every day, really. And at my age, I'm going to be the chairman of my 60th of the union at Harvard Business School. And every day I'm losing one of my classmates. So it's kind of sad. So I, I just feel I'm just very lucky. And I'm going to be, you know, people ask me, how are you? Because, you know, at my age, they want to know. And I say, I'm grateful. <laughs> I don't want to give them an organ symphony, which most isn't that good? Isn't that, that's a good. It's true. I mean, really. I mean, I got a bad shoulder and blah blah blah. But you know, why talk about that? Just say, look, I'm grateful. I'm grateful for being here and for being able to get up in the morning and look at the sunshine. Yes. Oh, that's a beautiful thing, Ed. I love everything about your attitude, and I can't wait to dive into this book. And I definitely am trying to come down to Nantucket for a round of golf next summer if you're around. Oh, of course, you're exactly right. I'm just Are you a saying. golfer? Are you a golfer? Uh, no, but what better place to learn? <laughs> you made it sound so lovely, Ed. That's freaking awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today. Thank you for including me in your life. You know, uh, I appreciate it very much. I know you probably have a lot of people to talk to. Aww. Sounds like a lot of fun. It is. I wish you the best. Thank you, Ed. And as they say in Star Wars... May the force be with you. Perfect. I can't think of a better way to end this interview, Ed. You take care of yourself. Dude, take good care. Have a happy holiday. You as well. Thank you.